Randy already um, was talking about parenting stress for parents of children with neurodevelopmental disorders, and just a quick literature research um, brought many, many articles, uh, and this is just an excerpt of some that I found. And uh, the general, uh, general results of these studies, parents are stressed. The general parenting causes stress, and uh, of course, having a child with neurodevelopmental disorders increases this stress significantly. The definition of stress, um, basically any automatic response for anything that happens in your environment causes stress in your body. What makes us different from the zebra in the uh, savanna that's get attacked by the lion is we have our big brain that thinks about the stress. The zebra is stressed for a very short moment. The lion attacks, very, very big stress. I can die or not. Then it's good, it survived the stress relieves. We, with our big brain, we think, okay, what could have happened? There will be another lion coming soon. Oh no, I could have died, no. Um, so our body stays in this constant stress all the time and um, we have a hard time to let that go. Um, I just want to make a quick uh, thought experiment with you. What are the thoughts that go through your head when you're stressed? What is it? Is it these very existential things, oh no, I'm gonna die. That, or is it, oh no, tomorrow I have to get this and this and this and this done. Um, so we have a future stress and we have a stress for past things. And mostly what we think makes our stress. There's a pretty good relation between stress and breathing. And um, for the zebra uh, that gets attacked by the lion, has very fast, rapid breathing for a short amount of time. <sighs> really, really high. And then it goes back to its normal breathing. If we experience long-term stress, we stay in this shallow and uh, less frequent breathing. Um, and I want to little, do a little experiment with you. Please put your hand on the chest and one hand on your abdomen, and then take a deep breath through your nose and explore which hand moves. If it's the upper hand, that means you're a thoracic breather. The breathing happens mostly in your chest. If you were able to make your lower hand move, that means you're an abdominal breather. You're able to really make use of your whole body for the breathing. Now it's a little hard to uh, experience that just with your hands, so there's something, um, new technology that's called biofeedback, it's actually around till the, uh, since the 1970s, but uh, to give you an idea how that looks like to really visualize what's happening in your body, biofeedback is the tool for that. On this graph, we now have a real-time insight into what's happening into Jonathan's body. The blue line indicates his breathing. And we put the belt around his belly. So if you would um, try to imagine be the zebra in the savanna and the lion is attacking you. So we have a very shallow uh, breathing frequency. And now let go of that and try to come back into your body and do the deep belly breathing. So he is able to control the breathing frequency. This red line is um, calculated from his heartbeat. The sensor he has on his finger measures his pulse frequency. And um, what we try to find in the research I'm doing is to integrate the breathing to control the heartbeat that then has an effect on uh, anxiety, aggression, stress level. This next, um, this is a uh, device, it's called the M-Wave from the HeartMath Institute. Uh, there are other devices on the market too, but this is the one that I'm working in with my research. It measures the blood volume pulse in the earlobe, and Jonathan is trying to um, get his heart rate linked his heart rate linked to the breathing, 
and then gets direct feedback from the software. In this software then, we can play little games to train our breathing and uh, to get the heart rate in frequency with the breathing. There are many different visualizations um, to help you bring your breathing and the heart rate into so the so-called coherence. And um, I brought uh, three of these devices for you to try out your own breathing and heart rate frequency after our talks. So this is just a little image um, in the topper, uh, top right of the software that I showed you on the top left is another visualization for breathing feedback. We have a little balloon that uh, linked to your breathing can expand or contract. So the patient really gets a great visualization of what's happening in the body. It's not just the hand, the, what you tried, but the picture, the image of the breathing. When you concentrate on your breathing, you can feel your whole body move. And this is a basic technique that reduces stress. My biofeedback study that is uh, currently ongoing has a very long title, but diaphragmatic breathing and heart rate variability training for improving self-regulation in fragile X syndrome and fragile X associated disorders. Um, I didn't stumble. This is uh, the main research uh, theme. Fragile X syndrome is a, a genetic disorder caused by a mutation on the X chromosome that very often goes along with autism in boys and social anxiety in boys and girls. So my study has a baseline measurement, then one part of the participants get the intervention, the M-Wave device that I just showed you, then we have another assessment, and then the second group who did receive no intervention in the first arm receives the intervention, and then we have a follow-up for both groups. And uh, it's an ongoing study, so just a little um, insight of two subjects so far. We have um, a pediatric anxiety rating scale, which is a questionnaire we give to the parents and also to the individuals themselves. And they rate their anxiety in different situations in the past two weeks. And for both subjects, we had a reduction in the anxiety symptoms. And then also as the baseline level, we measure all different psychophysiology measures in a stressful situation. We let the children do mental arithmetic, which for me would be very stressful, and for them it is as well. Um, so we have a baseline in which we measure how relaxed or how stressed they are at the baseline and then we let them do mental arithmetic and measure heart rate and breathing. And um, we have that for the before the intervention and after the intervention and compare these two um, results. And uh, for both subjects during the stress phase we had a reduction in the heart rate and um, a reduction in the stress level. For the things, this was a short insight into my research, uh, so thanks so much to the MIND Institute who made this possible, and also the Fragile X team, Patrick, and uh, Jonathan especially, my um, helpers for the study, and Randy, my mentor, and David Hessel, my other mentor. Thank you so much. So what I'm gonna ask everyone to do, <coughs> put everything down, Sit straight up, and by that I mean let your spine be straight, relax your shoulders. Because much of this work is first person direct experience. So you can have your eyes open, or you can close your eyes if you feel comfortable, but in either way just bring your gaze down. And what I want all of us to do, simply, is to shift your attention to noticing the movement of your breath, just inside the tip of the nose. You don't need to control or regulate or change anything. Simply bring your attention and focus it on noticing the gross and subtle sensations as you breathe in and as you breathe out. And see if you can bring Simply place your attention and notice the quality of the experience from moment to moment. No right, no wrong. Simply noticing the breath moving in 
and moving out. And then you might notice what does it feel like in your own mind-body laboratory, your own mind-body laboratory, right now? What does it feel like to be inside your own mind-body right this moment? And simply be with whatever you notice, dropping evaluation, critique, simply noticing your own breath, your own experience. Now, please take two deep, deep breaths at your own pace, and then open your eyes. And just for a moment, notice how you feel in your body, in your mind, right this moment. So this is the goal, very simply put. I love these images. <laughs> this is it. If you get nothing else, this is it. Ready? Going from this crazy glue, the sticky mind, the mind that is absorbed with habits that we've accrued 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years. Habits of thinking, habits of interpreting, habits of perceiving self and others. Crazy glue, stickiness. And how do you get to the right side of the screen? WD-40. So when I give talks in Europe, I have to explain what this is because they don't have WD-40. But WD-40 is this very simple, magical ingredient. Uh, it was the 40th attempt to put all these magical chemicals together. That's why it's 40. That you spray in places like locks where there's grit, dirt, yucky stuff, like all the over-learned habits and the neural pathways in our brains that are overused at the expense of other possible perspectives, other possible ways of letting attention, emotion, views of self, brain networks interact with each other. Why not? So the idea is that WD-40, different forms of contemplative practice, and mindfulness meditation is but one class of practices. There are many, 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 many. In fact, in the sutras, the texts that discuss 84,000 different methods, 84,000 different methods. Why? Because each of us, is so different. We're so very similar, but we're also different. So different methods for different people, also at different points in your lifespan. So the idea is how do you get from this crazy glue, prepotent, automatic, overlearned habits, some are useful, some are not, to a more fluid, flexible, open state of mind, represented by WD-40. Another way to think about it is going from this angst Confusion, pain, low self-esteem, anxious, depressed, low self-view, to a mind that's innovative, clear, lucent, spontaneous. So we could stop there. That would be enough. Another way of thinking about the effects of different practices, but mindfulness, and I'll define that in a moment. One simple way to think about it Mindfulness is like a flagpole that's stable, strong, solid. <clears throat> and the mind is like the flag fluttering, blown by wind, blown by habits, blown by propensities, blown by genetics and epigenetic forces, etc. And that this is kind of the chaos we live in. That is normal. But there's another aspect of our mind body, and I use our, you know, this metaphor that this is the laboratory. This mind-body is our own laboratory. It's the best one. It's free. You don't need a grant. It doesn't cost a penny. And there's so much interesting data happening right here. 
and that we can develop this capacity to have some aspect of ourself solid, stable, reliable, even when the whole world is chaotic. That's a sign of freedom. That's a sign of maturity. And it's developable. You can be developed. That's the cool thing. <clears throat> Mindfulness-based stress reduction was started about 40 plus years ago at UMass Medical Center. John Kabat-Zinn, a molecular biologist from uh, who did uh, his PhD at MIT. He was there at the UMass Medical Center and he saw all these pain patients being cut, drugged, deviced, if I can use that word. And he said, can I offer something else? So he was really into Zen meditation. So he offered, started a clinic where he started taking all the rejects, people who had chronic pain, who were just rejects from the pain clinic. And there are many of them. And he said, let me offer something. So he put together a whole hodgepodge of practices, formal meditation practices like breath focused, body scan, different practices to train different aspects of attention, loving kindness, compassion, etc. Informal meditation practices like we just did now, as brief as the next breath. So don't, don't shift your body at all. Just notice the inhalation and the, ne and the exhalation of your next breath. There you go, that's it. If you do just that, several times a day, anytime, anywhere, any context, that's this, these brief, meaningful pauses that begin like a trickle to create a, a little stream that becomes a pond, that becomes an ocean of gravitas, of ability to be psychologically flexible. And it can be just moments, 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 moments. The other aspect that's very powerful here is Hatha Yoga. So notice that there's yoga by itself is very pow powerful. All these different meditation uh, contemplative practices are powerful. So the standard eight week program is a full program. Has anybody here done the eight weeks MBSR course? No one, okay, good. It's very inexpensive. It's very, it's offered everywhere. It's about $300. That's a lot cheaper than psychotherapy for eight weeks. <laughs> um, and it has incredible beneficial effects, which I'll mention in a moment. So this is John Kabat-Zinn, who really is a pioneer in the sense that he made, brought this program, MBSR, Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction, into a Western context. He defines the, the mindfulness, uh, mindfulness in the following way. Paying attention in a particular way on purpose, volitionally, with intention, in the present moment. So not the past, not the future. I like to call it soap opera mind. Past tripping, future tripping. But actually bringing the mind back to the present moment, right now, embodied in who you are. And the hardest part for Westerners, to do this in a non-judgmental manner. Most of us go, oh, you know, I can't harness my attention, I suck, I can't meditate. I'm never going to be good at this, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> That's the spinning mind, that kind of spinning mind, that sticky mind, that crazy glue, the crazy mind. So this is just one way to define uh, some of the aspects of mindfulness meditation states of mind. So again, I'm going to ask us to um, just drop in is one way to, to put it. So you, again, you can have your eyes open or your eyes closed, however you feel comfortable but I want you to be the scientists that you are. The brain is inherently scientific. That's the only way human species, human animals, continue to exist is because we ask questions. We're curious. We want to understand. So I'm going to ask you to, to take a moment to understand your own mind right now. So again, start by bringing the attention gently but vividly just inside the tip of the nose and see if you can place the focus of your attention there and simply notice as you breathe in and as you breathe out. Notice gross and subtle sensations of the breath. Let that be the anchor for your attention. Now shift your attention to sound and notice any and all types of sound. Shift
Shift your attention to the sole of your left foot. The sole of your left foot. And see if you can notice any subtle sensations. Tingling, heat, shift of weight, sensation on the sole of your left foot. And then bring your attention back to the tip of the nose, just inside the nostrils, simply noticing the breath, moving in and moving out. No right, no wrong. Then take one deep, deep, deep breath and open your eyes. Just notice how you feel right this moment in your own mind body without judgment. How do I feel? However I feel. Okay. So just briefly, there's now about three decades of research on uh, mindfulness meditation, but there are many forms of contemplative practice. But just in terms of Zen, Vipassana, Christian prayer, uh, um, all kinds of uh, TM, there's a long history from like 30, 40, 50 years now, and it's becoming a huge burgeoning area of research that's even funded by NIH. But very simply put, Contemplative practices, and there are many, many different kinds. Mindfulness practices is only one small category. Um, we now know from meta-analyses, not individual studies, but across 30, 40, 50 studies, symptoms of stress, depression, anxiety, go down reliably, both in healthy adults and also adults who are diagnosed with anxiety, depression, stress disorders, et cetera, et cetera, a whole panoply of things. So that's very solid. Symptoms of stress, depression, anxiety go down. In terms of brain imaging, we know that limbic systems, areas of the brain that have to do with re emotional reactivity, are actually modified down, less emotionally reactive to internal and external cues. We know that different uh, brain networks that are related to different aspects of attention, the ability to focus attention, to shift attention, to regulate goal-oriented regulation of attention, those brain networks are enhanced. We know in terms of heart functioning that different uh, um, symptoms of heart diseases are not removed, but they're um, actually reduced, and the anxiety and depression that are related to having heart disorders, cardiovascular disorders, go down, especially in women. We also know in terms of the immune system, another level of granularity or window into human functioning, the body's ability to mount an immune response to the flu, influenza virus, or other things, actually is enhanced through different forms of meditation practices. And then on another level, just well-being, however you measure it, has definitely been shown reliably to go up with uh, different kinds of meditation practices, as short as two months, but of course much more so as you do it longer and longer. I'm going to show you just one other thing because I'm going to just give you a little bit about the brain. When a stimulus occurs, so when you're being very quiet and some nasty memory or thought or slight or image appears in the mind, or you're just going to work and you say, hello, friend, and your friend walks right by you, in a millisecond, you start, your mind starts getting reactive, right? Or somebody sends you an email and says, come to my office in five minutes. Stop. The ambiguity causes a lot of anxiety, fear, worry, future tripping, projection. So a stimulus can be real or imagined. We know that the brain in human animals, us, has been sculpted through evolution. Millions and millions of years, these networks allow us to then go into a reactive state in milliseconds, even before there is conscious awareness that I'm aroused. And our emotions shift in milliseconds to either a very positive state of happiness, joy, or fear worry, anxiety, jealousy. 
This sends a bottom-up signal to other parts of the brain that then hopefully implement top-down regulation, taking perspective, taking cognitive re reappraisal, to re uh, restructuring or rethinking about what's the meaning of this reactivity or this stimulus, or shifting attention to something that's less evocative, which then does top-down regulation, along with two other modules that are unique to human animals, which is how we view ourselves. There is no self in the brain. Neuroscience established that. But there are self-related processes, self-focused attention, representing yourself in a context. Those are things we can actually see. When a person is thinking about themselves, there's a three brain region, midline set, that is powerfully activated. So we can actually see with brain imaging, neuroimaging, when you're thinking about yourself. And how we talk to ourselves, our inner self-talk. It's three brain networks here on the left, uh, regions on the left side. We can see when people are actually engaged in talking to themselves or thinking. How these brain networks are interacting represents psychological flexibility, represents WD-40. This is WD-40. When this is not working well, the system, hyper-emotional reactivity, stress, depression, anxiety, eating disorders, suicidal ideation, et cetera, et cetera. When there's not enough top-down effective modulation of emotional reactivity, this leads to dysregulation. But when this is working really well, this whole system, then I suggest that we are actually much more emotionally aware, much more comfortable feeling anything. So this is the system, and there are many more modules, but this is a very simple uh, brain model of that we use as a tool to investigate different um, brain functions, psychological functions. There are many different forms of contemplative practices. In the same way you think about preschool through K, elementary, middle school, high school, college, maybe PhD, MD, you learn many different skills. Likewise, there's a lifespan trajectory, a developmental trajectory of different kinds of meditation or contemplative practices that develop different qualities or tools in the mind. So simply put, there's a whole bunch that have to do with concentration. You begin with the ability of harnessing your attention, fo focusing your attention as needed. There are many, many practices. That's in the goal of then being able to use this incredibly powerful analytic, linguistic, logic, reasoning capacity in the human mind, which then again develops a whole set of skills for doing what's called uh, meditation or contemplation on emptiness, or shunyata in Sanskrit, which is the actual medicine. And this has uh, many different names, non-dual, but essentially it has to do with piercing through into reality and removing distorted views, distorted ways that we conceive about self and other that get us into trouble. Jealousy, anger, hatred, isolation, loneliness. So this last category is a whole set of practices that's the actual medicine. Everything else before that is uh, um, preliminary. Preparing the mind to be able to do the harder work of this other kind of practice. So I just wanted to share that with you because people usually don't understand that, that just like cognitive development over time, there's a meditation development over time. And usually you do this in the context of it having a teacher. So I'm going to say uh, thank you for listening and for practicing yourself. Hope this was useful. And hopefully there'll be many more uh, arenas where we can interact in even greater detail. So since our um to or our, our patient who wanted to come in and, and give her a little testimonial about how uh, she felt about the program and how uh, it helped her. Couldn't come in because she's sick, unfortunately, um, which breathing might not help at this time, but um, she still practices. Um, <clears throat> so uh, Shelby, her mother, sent me a little um, email about the things she's noticed about faith. Um, her daughter who participated in our study. Um, so I'm just going to read it to you. Uh, Faith was still having meltdowns and being very uncooperative in her morning responsibilities. The program taught Faith how to have control of herself, her breathing, and gave her a tool to help um, herself keep herself in control. Um, she's been doing great. She has not had any meltdowns, and when she gets upset, her recovery from it uh, is quick, and she normally apologizes for her frustration and reaction. <laughs> she's doing better on, on her schoolwork, uh, but is still letting the nature of other children get to her sometimes. Um, Faith is very bright and can focus on a goal and meet it now. 
Uh, <clears throat> she is much happier and is a blessing to be around. As a mom who loves her child very much, I am glad to have her mentally and physically strong because of the knowledge and control she, she learned from the Mind Institute. Uh, she is a much better person to be around and we are not on guard waiting for her to have a meltdown. Uh, we are all uh, much happier and focused on living and not just surviving. Thank you, my institute, for all you have done for our family and others. Thank you, Shelby Hazen. How do you find a MBSR course? Um, he, do you live here in yes. Sacramento? Yes. So um, uh, there's, uh, what's her name? Erg. Forgetting her name. There's a woman who lives in Davis, but teaches. Uh, she's almost certified. That's a whole other thing. Is you want the quality of the person who's teaching the course? Um, I'll get you her name. I'll get it in my laptop. She teaches both in Davis and here uh, regularly. Actually, every week. And the standard there's the standard MBSR course is usually eight weeks long, two and a half hours once a week, and a one day retreat. And it's usually three hundred dollars. Right? And actually, it's in some states, I don't think California, it's reimbursed through insurance. Um, and yeah, so I'll get you the name in a second. In fact, I'll work okay, on that you. right now. But it's, it's available here. In the biofeedback training, when you register your breath with the heart rate, what actually happens physiologically? Do the cortisol levels go down? Does the autonomic system, does it stimulate GABA or inhibition for reactivity. Can you talk a little bit about the, you know, physiology uh, behind the benefits? That's a great question. And um, the whole research into heart rate variability um, has a long history as well. And heart rate variability training is linked to um, performance in sports and concentration um, into blood pressure uh, reduction, and the whole research into the neurotransmitter and the brain system, it's not that much evolved yet. We just know uh, cortisol levels are dropping, and um, self-reported stress levels drop too. And the participant who underwent uh, the training is better able to negotiate stressful situations and uh, self-regulate the own arousal. If you remember this uh, bell shape, I've, I'm sure everybody has seen it, this uh, rever inverse uh, bell shape curve. There's this optimum level of performance. When you have a too high arousal, your performance drops. If you have a lo low arousal, you don't perform as well. There's this optimum level. And with the heart rate variability training, it helps you to actively control when you are in this optimal level of arousal. So I have several patients that have difficulty in sleeping. So has uh, mindfulness or biofeedback been applied to helping sleep disturbances? Because when parents are stressed or when you're depressed, oftentimes you can't sleep. You can't turn off your mind. Um, have there been studies showing that this, either one of these interventions can help with sleep disturbances? It depends, yes. So the first is yes, there are studies. Uh, they do show different findings depending on what kind of um, dosage the practices are being done in. So for example, in sleep studies, uh, Willoughby Britton at um, Brown University in Rhode Island, in people who are long-term meditators, uh, who did like hour a day for many years, they actually disturbed their sleep in the sense that they slept less. But that's probably because they needed less sleep. In people who do classes like MBSR, who are coming in as novices or newbies or beginners, in fact, just the stress reduction, the reduction in symptoms of anxiety and depression, that's been shown to in, uh, increase the quality of sleep. So we just finished a study at Stanford now um, where we did self-reported sleep uh, as one dependent variable that we looked at in people with anxiety disorders. And definitely the quality of sleep improves after, uh, after eight, eight weeks of this um, mindfulness meditation course. So in fact, it does. And, and it, it get even more specific. We didn't do it, but there's one practice called the body scan, which has to do with shifting your attention to different parts of the body and simply placing the attention there, noticing. Uh, that practice by itself, especially when done in bed with an audio tape or once you learn it by yourself, people tend to fall asleep. 
people who tend to have sleep onset insomnia or insomnia in the middle of the night as well. So even that one practice has been shown to help people reduce, shift their attention and uh, make it easier to fall asleep. So it can, yes, there are some benefits. And then, you know, secondarily, if you improve the quality of sleep, you know, there's so much research going on now about how sleep rids your brain of different toxins, even dissolves plaques and uh, helps with the, you know, cardiovascular aspects or, um, you know, hypoxic problems in the brain at night. Uh, that could have additional benefits. Yeah, I mean, I, I think very, one very simple model, eat greens, less meat, eat greens, exercise a lot, or regularly, it don't have to be a lot, regularly, and sleep, go to bed early, and go to bed, I used to be a sleep researcher, did my master's thesis on sleep disorders. But just doing that, so it's always think about like multiple things, less stress, more sleep, regular sleep, more greens, and uh, more exercise. And then if you throw in meditation, that's an added bonus of, that'll help with almost everything. <laughs> Two part question, one, about mindfulness and relation with ADHD, as well as how can we not necessarily use the word mindfulness or meditation, because sometimes they think it's religious, they wanna kinda shy away from it, but what types of tips and strategies do you have in regards to you know, talking about mindfulness, but without necessarily using the word mindfulness so that we could reach more general population. Let's stay with the first question. Yeah, so first, in terms of uh, specifically research, clinical research on attention deficit disorder, Lydia Zalowski, psychiatrist, was at UCLA, now is uh, in Santa Cruz, um, private practice, but she developed and published, and it's available on Amazon, um, a mindfulness meditation program for people with attention deficit disorder. And the MARC Center at UCLA, M-A-R-C, Mindful Awareness Research Center, uh, one of the main things that they've been doing is working on uh, setting up programs for adults with ADHD, teenagers, and then younger kids. So far, the empirical evidence suggests that it's definitely been beneficial for the adults, mixed for the teenagers, because teenagers are very complex and difficult, I, right? And kids, um, just children are really not ready to do any meditation. So in terms of languaging, for many years, uh, hardcore researchers in Europe and here did not use any word, did not use the words meditation or mindfulness. It's only in the past 10 years that now it's completely accepted in neuroscience now. Um, even JAMA, you know, is publishing papers on meditation now. But um, in terms of languaging, it used to be attention control, attention allocation, attention regulation. They used all these other phrases. Now, it's in science, at least now, you don't have to hide anything. You, people are studying everything. Um, but in organizations where they are sensitive to meditation as being a religious thing, uh, then yes, say attention training. You don't have to use the word meditation. Meditation in Sanskrit, um, bhavna, means to cultivate. It just means a technology to cultivate qualities in the mind. So you, can, so you can just say it's training, attention training, although it's much more than attention training, but you can use that. And no, and no administrator or principal would ever be at, uh, uh, have antipathy towards enhancing attention training in my staff, in my teachers, and my students. Yeah, that's a skillful way. Oh, you had a second part two. Oh, that was the part two? Yeah. Oh. You know, a lot of times with families, uh, they talk about the deadly hour being from like 5.30 to 7 when people are cooking dinner, trying to work out, do homework, trying to manage 10 things at once. And I'm wondering if there's any, you know, way you could sort of gradually introduce sort of the mindfulness into those routines so that, you know, by 7.01 you're not exhausted for the rest of the night and your kids are, you know, everyone's a little more content. Yeah, we actually did one stand, uh, study when I was at Stanford that was a mindfulness program for families. And it was uh, uh, eight to 12 year olds and their parents. One, two, three, four, however many parents, however many siblings. The parents benefited hugely. The kids benefited a little bit, at least what we could measure. Um, but one of the things that we used was a very, and I can bring that up as well. Uh, I, um, we used a 
CD that had very short practices, as short as one minute, two minutes, three minutes, four minutes, and they were visuals, like visual, visualizing an otter floating on its back on a pond. And what we found is we encouraged the families to just really innovate. So they would use it before homework, when kids were stressed out about doing homework. Oh, let's just pause. They would do it in the bathtub. They would do it before bed. They might do it just before, um, after, just after eating a meal, before transitioning into another activity. And it can be done with the audio or without. But we asked people to just try very, very short practices. That's why I use the, the, meaning, the brief, meaningful pauses. So right this moment, again, just notice the next breath. Stop. So you can do just that. It doesn't, so what's important is you don't have to be like some ascetic and do 30 minutes silent meditation with legs crossed. You could, but you don't need to, to reap the benefits. So yes, we are all super busy, but even at the School of Nursing, uh, now we just Thursdays at noon, 20 minutes in the conference room. Anyone can show up. So you want to integrate it, and that's the key thing, is integrate these brief little practices into anything and everything you do. You get in the car today, before you start, start the engine, just notice the next three breaths. You're at a red light, you have about 30 seconds. Just notice two breaths. So you can actually weave it into whatever you're doing. And when we teach these courses, that we encourage people to be super creative. Integrate it into anything. And when you make your first cup of coffee, that's what I do, in the morning, the first, the smell, the taste, the sensation, the pleasure. So you can map on this quality of awareness, which we already have, on anything. Drinking the next sip of water. So many families have kids that have outburst behavior. And for kids with intellectual disabilities, you know, cognitive deficits, autism, fragile X, 22Q deletion, whatever, they are dealing with tantrum behavior, often aggression towards the mother, but sometimes towards the father too. Um, has there been research in trying to work with these kids with uh, pretty significant developmental disabilities to help to control outburst behavior? I'm not aware of that. I think more for the parents. But do you think it's possible to do this with the patients themselves? Yeah, I think you'd modify it in the same way that, um, like, I'm trained in cognitive behavioral therapy, right? And so when uh, 20 years, 15 years ago, they started doing it for people diagnosed with thought disorders, like schizophrenia, et cetera, it had to be simplified and modified. Uh, you could imagine training kids in one or two specific practices, training the kids, adolescents, when they're in an okay state, having them practice how to implement it, even having a cue. For example, um, could even be some the color blue on a piece of paper. And every time an outburst is happening, the parent could just do that. And if it's associated with just pausing or even just simply relaxing the shoulders. So I would, I would actually play a lot with modifying cues that are person-specific, even perhaps child-chosen, selected, to uh, that he or she will use as a reminder. Because the word uh, mindfulness in, in Tibetan, tempa, actually means to remember. To remember to come back to the present moment. To, to remember. So in fact, I think that it's plausible, it's possible. Um, yeah. Yeah, I read of one study with my um, mindfulness-based uh, stress reduction in adults with in intellectual disability who were living um, in a uh, home together. And uh, they use a lot of visualization. So verbal with words, with words it doesn't uh, work as well. So um, exactly what uh, Dr. Golden said, have a visual cue for these adults. It was a picture of a, um, I think it was a gorilla sleeping and the 
picture of the gorilla sleeping was trained to a muscular and muscle uh, relaxation, to let go of a clenched fist. So during the training of uh, linking this image of the sleeping gorilla to the clenched fist, let go of the fist. So now they only needed the picture, the image, to really induce a relaxation uh, reaction. So on a very basic individual level, it was possible to train even nonverbal adults to have a reaction, a relaxation like that. I think before the outburst occurs, I think Philippe's uh, issue about getting them trained to do that with the cue when they're not upset and make that training on a regular basis so that when they start to escalate, because a lot of these patients have hyperarousal, the lack of inhibitory abilities to control that hyperarousal. So maybe if this um, you know, practice is something that's second nature, if you will, and with a visual cue, before the hyperarousal gets completely out of control, you can begin you know, to have them move into this routine that they're very used to, so it maybe becomes automatic um, you know, for self-calming. But yeah. there, there is some evidence about uh, you know, yoga, mindfulness, meditation, mm. increasing GABA yeah. inhibition. Uh, and that's what you really want to stimulate, because many of these patients... Yeah. And I'm thinking also from just uh, starting from the, from the brain side. Like, we know that inhibitory control, which is super important for attention control, which then is important for emotion regulation, starts here. It's actually right dorsolateral, right ventrolateral. And there are uh, information processing tasks, like the go-no-go -go task, which actually drives these parts of the brain, which actually rely on inhibitory control. So I never thought about it, but like you could take uh, the perspective of training someone to, to uh, enhance the muscles of inhibitory control, and you can actually see it here on this side of the brain, the right prefrontal cortex. That also might be a way to uh, increase uh, recruitability or accessibility to that inhibitory control network. I hadn't thought about that. You could take that. The training could be to increase the muscle of inhibitory control, so to speak. And you could even measure GABA with some uh, um, neurophysiological techniques. There's, there's also a whole other aspect here, which is um, that from just, again, from just from the neuroscience perspective, right now, I'm not even looking at this gentleman, but my brain is picking up millions, if not billions of cues from him, processing it. I'm not aware of it. And I'm pinging back and influencing him. Like right now, there's, I could actually increase his heart rate if I wanted to, I could change his cortisol, I could actually activate his amygdala, simply meaning, and there are actually studies where they've had two adults in two different uh, fMRI, MRI scanners activating each other and influencing, modulating, to demonstrate that um, human brains have evolved, that right now, the 30 people in the room, our brains are constantly pinging each other and influencing each other in ways that we don't even understand. The point being, because I have two daughters, three and a half and six and a half, and I think having kids is the ultimate meditation practice, obviously, because they trigger stuff. But what I was meant to say, and what I'm trying to emphasize, is that the way that we, the caregivers, or, or people who are present with our kids, parents, uh, the way that we react or don't react, or the timing or the quality of how our, we're reacting on the brain and the body facial expression is from moment to moment to moment influencing the little person obviously but we actually have more and more evidence of how from moment to moment we're actually sculpting their re brains so a whole other arena is uh, and benefit is when we as parents can stay chill uh, how are we modeling and re reflecting something that's not freaking out so that they pick up that signal and freak out more. So it may not be that, that my child will never have an anxiety or freak out attack, but maybe the duration instead of 30 minutes it comes down to 15 minutes. That already be, would be a huge improvement. In addition to me seeing every moment, every time that my child freaks out, call it freak out, and my daughters do it, <laughs> 
How do I use that for training my own mind? Oh, I notice anger rising. I notice uh, ang fear. I notice wanting to run away. I notice being angry at my partner because I want her to take care of it, not me, or whatever. You know, all these things. So actually taking each of these episodes as an opportunity for me to train my own mind as well. When you first start off, it's definitely overwhelming. There's so mm -hmm. much, and you know, but in reaction, it's really hard to do. So what can you say about modeling you know, for the child and depending on what level the child is um, in regards to how capable they are of retaining or understanding? Like, what kind of modeling can a parent do um, verbally, facial, like, can you, do you have like different scenarios or examples that you could share that's scripted like? Um, not exactly, but one thing I can share when we did this study of eight to 12 year olds and their parents in, at Stanford, Palo Alto area, we actually had to stop enrollment. We had too many families showing up because it's a hyper stressed out overachieving place. But one thing that was fascinating, we did assessments for two hours with the kids and with the parents. We asked the parents to leave. We had kids, eight to 12 year olds, who when the parent was present, I remember one time this girl was like under a table and agitated. When the parent left, she came out and then she said, okay, I'm ready, what should we do? Meaning context matters, meaning that in some, for some of these kids, maybe not autism, but at least for some of these kids from that area that were anxious, when the parents stepped away and with, with a, another adult, suddenly they were, they were um, less anxious, they were more attentive, which I found, that to me was fascinating to, to observe that. And so it makes me wonder what I do to my kids. <laughs> um, but in terms of specific scenarios of things to do, I think going back to, I think what we need to do is go back to uh, clinical research studies. So if there's visualization tools, if there's ways to help, and, and again, it's gonna be person specific, because it's not one method will work for everyone, 84,000 different methods. Um, oh, you weren't here for that during the talk, sorry. Um, but anyway, that we'll have to find out, um, ideally, if it's something that can, you know, you wanna test different methods and see for this particular child or person, what cue or cues can this person use? So, you know, mentioning a, a, very, a specific relaxed body state and using a cue that, that induces that, that reminds the person to shift into a body state, nonverbal. So I think we have to experiment person-specific cues and context that that person's uh, willing to either generate themselves or try out themselves. Um, yeah, yeah. And it could be a breath, it could be a, a color, it could be a, a piece of music that you hear. We know that music, right, auditory processing is already functioning in the fetus well before they even come out from mama. So that's a place that's early, early development. We know that music in people with dementia can suddenly trigger a memory from you know, 60 years ago. So that's another avenue that can be used uh, as an example. So I think we have to try out, each of us have to be the scientists that we are and try out methods, um, yeah. The UC Davis Mind Institute was created in 1998 with a promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other brain disorders are helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.